the problem starts when um, many insurers are associating themselves to the kind of AI that is grabbing headlines today. I think that's where there's a lot of um, hype and noise. Hello and welcome to the Instec London podcast episode number 31. This is Matthew Grant. I am one of the partners at Instec London and what follows is the edited highlights from the first half of our recent event on artificial intelligence and algorithms. And in this episode, I'm talking to four of the leading individuals and companies that are either building products that are successfully using AI or investing in these kind of companies. We cover topics such as whether an algorithm is humble enough to admit when it's wrong, what's happening outside of underwriting and claims in AI, and how should companies attract more data science into the insurance. And then finally, what is the money ball effect? On stage with me are Reza Kashidi, Chief Scientist from AIG, Hamza Chowdhury, Director of Deployment from Saitora, Mark Cunningham, Co-Founder and CEO of Wenfresh, and finally Nick Martin, Fund Manager from Polar Capital. Reza, you, you are one of the early Instec London um, attendees. I think there was probably about a handful of people in the room the first, last time you came here. It's grown a bit, grown a bit since then. Yeah, it's a wonderful event, and um, I think early days it was really good to have you guys starting this community. And I think since then um, it's been continuing to get a lot of the practi uh, practitioners in the field together. And in that, I think it was definitely one of the contributing factors to London's success in, in building this community early, for sure. It almost seems every company today you come across in this space has got AI in there. So you, you, you've got a background or you've certainly got experience in data science. Uh, you're the chief scientist for AIG. In your mind, has the market got like a bit of a head of itself in, in terms of companies using AI? Uh, is it really a lot of hype and not much behind that? Or are you seeing some, some real examples of effective use of AI and algorithms? I, th I think in general, the, the the, the amount of noise for sure is there. I mean, like if you look at, there was a recent article in Financial Times that was uh, looking at the z thousands of startups across Europe and almost half of them, I mean, uh, AI startups in Europe, and almost half of them were using the terms such as AI, but were not actually doing anything related to AI. So it's the kind of term that gets um, uh, mentioned a lot in executive uh, calls. It, it's a term that gets mentioned in a lot of startups' websites, gives them bigger rounds of funding probably. Um, but the reality is that um, there, not everybody is, is necessarily doing it. And I think probably um, a simple test could be, like I mean, Warren Buffett has got this famous quote that only when the tide goes out, you'll see who's swimming naked. Um, I think with AI, you don't need to wait until the tide goes out. I mean, AI as a, as a scientific discipline has got a lot of communities and like if, if you want to really see a company is doing AI, you can look at the number of publications they have, the number of real scientists they have, because it doesn't happen magically through somebody dreaming it about AI and tomorrow morning waking up and coding in Python and writing an LP algorithm. It's not like that. So in a way, you can look at the um, community. And the, one way to kind of separate hype from real signal could be something like that. But of course, that's not the only thing. There, there could be a lot of other things. So in general, I think insurance, in terms of its potential for using AI, has got definitely one of the biggest potentials as an industry. And also, in terms of not only it can help the insurance as we define it today to, to improve and, and become better at servicing its clients, but also AI has the potential to broaden insurance companies' mandates and reach to the um, social good and services that it can provide. So, so generally speaking, AI is up, almost happening in the industry, has got high potential, but still a long way to go for sure. Yeah, and I just want to make sure we pick up on that point, which is you're saying that you know, it's not just about the marketing material, but if anybody wants to understand a company, whether I guess an insurance company or a technology company, look at who they've got that are real data scientists or have got a background, look at the papers they've produced, look at the citations they've got. They'll tell you if they're real or if they're just putting the label on it. But also the other thing I think a lot of us think about AI primarily in the area of underwriting and claims, but you're seeing other areas where AI is also starting to be used for insurance companies beyond maybe the more common yeah. understandings. I, th I think th there's a little bit of an issue with the term AI. It's like it's become almost a catch-all phrase that everybody uses for everything. Um, and I think if you really dissociate, like when you open the TV or read the newspaper or go online on cert certain websites, you hear the term AI usually talking about cutting-edge machine learning, it being in 
applications such as natural language processing or computer vision or um, strategy learning, reinforcement learning, and so on. So, so there is a huge amount of developments that we have seen in the past less than a decade uh, due to explosion in data and, and, and cheap compute power and so on in the world of machine learning. And that's the kind of stuff that comes in the headlines today. So if, we, if by AI we mean that, I think, of course, there is a huge amount of hype and, and scientific papers and so on could be a good metric. But when we talk about a more uh, simple and traditional way of doing machine learning, more like a statistical models and stuff like that, or what you can call early days of statistical machine learning and so on. I mean, insurance companies are pioneers of that domain. I mean, most insurance companies have been doing a lot of the foundations of statistics, um, life tables and mortality models and, and many other things, actuarial models and so on. A lot of these things built a lot of the foundational topics in stats. But I think that the problem starts when um, many insurers are associating themselves to the kind of AI that is grabbing headlines today. I think that's where there's a lot of um, hype and noise. But still, I think at an industry, we, we can be proud of being quantitative. We have done a lot of great works, but we should not think that we've done everything that is out there to be done. Now, I think back to your um, second question, I think around um, the, is it all about underwriting? Of course, underwriting is one of the most important uh, aspects of insurance value chain. But of course, if you really look at, um, like if you say an insurance company made $1 worth of premium, how does that dollar work in terms of the value chain? Around, I mean, there was actually a recent uh, report by Swiss Re that does a nice way of summarizing that across a range of geographies and products. But in commercial insurance, for example, typically that number could be split around 60, 70% for loss ratio. Like 60, 70 cents goes for loss ratio, 20, 30 cents goes to acquisition ratio, 10, 15 or so goes to internal operational expense, and then whatever is left, if it's still anything, that would be your underwriting profit. So, um, and then the, the other aspect of the income for insurance companies is through investments. They invest the money and then that returns uh, some additional um, income. And, 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 and if you look at it, a big insurance company, for example, likes of the top five, 10 brands that we know in the industry, they end up having hundreds of billions of dollars of asset they manage. So if you think about how much impact they can gain through being superior in investment strategies and so on they do, I think there's a huge room there for them to stay competitive and still compensate for some other aspects of the value chain. The second thing is probably the biggest part of that one, one dollar that goes towards loss ratio. And that one, that 60, 70 cents, how do you take care of that? Um, a lot of the time insurers think about underwriting and pricing as the only lever they have for that. But actually there's a huge amount of um, for example, risk mitigation that could drive that that that's uh, that um, part of the uh, cost down. Like for example, recently we partnered with a company called Dark Trace in the cyberspace, uh, where we are trying to not only we do insurance in the cyber world, but also we try to use machine learning um, for for understanding the the patterns we see in the network and associating them with a risky situation or not. Hence, um, hoping for a, a lower prevalence of claim due to that risk mitigation strategy. And I think. The, the story could go even further in, in health and life and, and other lines of business where customers are staying with you for 10 plus years sometimes. They give you so much data on a daily basis, like a watch alone could generate even up to gigabytes of data. And, and on top of that, you've got hundreds of thousands of genetic markers from a pest. And on top of that, you can have many um, social and, and, and lifestyle activities recorded. So in that sort of world, I think AI could be definitely Im impactful even in underwriting, and, but of course, Risk mitigation is definitely one of the other areas. But of course, the usual suspects, underwriting and claim, stay relevant, but they should, that should not come at the cost of forgetting about other parts of the value chain, which actually might be more ready and might be actually more relevant to the um, advanced topics of AI. Reza, you're, you're doing some work as well to encourage other people to come into the industry, into the insurance industry, with, with, a, with a background in this area. Can you just say a few words about that and how people can find out more, more about it? I think, I think the, the biggest thing we need to do as an industry is really to kind of, I think, I think if you think about it, I mean, probably we need, we need a, f we can phrase the story in many different ways. But if you really think about what does the planet and the people on the planet care about, um, insurance as an industry is touching more than any other industry, you can say. And, and yet, when you look at uh, where does the talent go, where does, if, if it's a scientist, if it's an engineer, if it's a design person and so on, where do they go? They, 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 definitely insurance is not their number one choice. Partly because um, they haven't heard very different aspects of, I mean, most of them think about insurance as an industry 
being purely about their home and car insurance or their travel insurance, which a lot of time they don't know about it unless they make a claim and a lot of time for them it might not be a pleasant experience and so on. So in a way, it's, it's very um, kind of um, unfair to us as an industry to not do, do the effort to, to portray that uh, real image of impact on the uh, society that we are truly having. And, and I think, and in, I think it's, it's, it's about time for us to go out there, tell different messages, better messages, inspire the young talent in, in AI and various other uh, tech and so on discipline to consider a insurance as, as a top destination. But of course, uh, anybody who's interested in this, I'm more than happy to talk more, but, but yeah, so. Great, well, I hope you come back, Reza, and, and talk to us a bit more about that, and we'd certainly be very happy to, to uh, support you. Well, thank sure. you very much. Yeah, no thank you. Okay, next up we have Hamza Shadri from Saitora. Most people, I believe, will have known about Saitora, but perhaps could you just give us, uh, kind of in a nutshell, uh, what you do? You talk a lot about AI and what you do at Saitora, but also what you do yourself in your, in your role at Saitora. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know about Saitora, we are focused on the commercial underwriting space. Um, and in a nutshell, what we try and do is help insurers or help to enable them to automate uh, parts of the underwriting workflow. And I use those words very carefully, help to enable. We don't do the automation of the, of the workflow. And we can get into that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, all the way through from submission to bind, um, we're really trying to make underwriters' lives easier by taking away the low-level tasks that are extremely manual, that are good machine learning and artificial intelligence problems. Um, me specifically, so I head up our deployment team, which essentially focuses on product delivery. What that means is I work with our customers to try and figure out what is the killer use case for our product stack uh, that can help them derive some value in the business. Ultimately, if it's not deriving value, it's not a real use case. So that's a big part for us. So your, so your role is that critical point between the customer and the people that are building, building the technology. Is, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my background's in software engineering, and before that I was a management consultant. So it's a little bit between both. What is it about Saitora that makes you different from other people that presumably have also got access to the same kind of data if it's out there on the, on the internet? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we've been in this sort of game of data collection and building predictive models even before we were in insurance uh, and what we call artificial intelligence, essentially using these machine learning al algorithms to try and predict kinds of events and all kinds of different things that happen. We've been doing this for a long time, but really what makes us different is not necessarily the artificial intelligence. Building on what Reza mentioned in the previous chat, the actual algorithms that are being used have been around for 20 or 30 years. Nothing is new about that. What's really changed is the access to data and the price of computing that's come down massively. But what we add on top of that is we build things into actual programmatic products that can be used by humans. An artificial intelligence model by itself is not particularly useful. It doesn't really do anything. It's when you build it into a wider product that is actually able to be ingested by a company and used to create what we call a positive outcome. So does this product actually let you make a next decision? Uh, does it let you make a decision about what you want to do with that risk or whatever you want to do with the rest of your workflow? So I guess your, your, your key part there, which certainly for me is a sort of way of distinguishing the, again, the noise and the reality is you're providing information to the underwriters that they can take an active decision on. So what happens when, when the tools you've built or the algorithm doesn't know the answer? Is it smart enough to say, and humble enough to say, I don't know, or does it just give the kind of best guess and hope that's good enough? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of study about what sh how should machine learning algorithms act when there isn't enough information. Um, what this really boils down to is, have you got a good prediction problem? And for those of you who've read Prediction Machines by Ajay Agarwal, and if you haven't, I highly recommend reading it. Um, most really good machine learning applications are meant to be used with a human there as well. Uh, so the way that we work with those kinds of problems is we say, if there isn't enough information, don't guess. Um, you have to remember at its core, machine learning is about making predictions. It's never about full certainty and you know, the ground truth. Um, but we have confidence thresholds that we want to meet, and if we can't meet that, then you know, I like the way you put it, the algorithm is humble enough uh, to say, this one's not for me, you need to apply your best human judgment. Uh, but even with that information, you know, the way that we talk about it is you have to enable an underwriter to make those decisions by giving them more information than, I think somebody previously said, a bionic underwriter. That's a pretty good way of putting it. So. Yeah, and I noticed the way you've positioned the, what you're offering has shifted a little bit from 
it replaces the underwriter and the way that Richard Hartley now describes it is it enables the underwriter to do more in their day. So I think it links back to that point about you still need the human intervention and I guess it's difficult to sell a product to an underwriter if part of that pitch is that they're not going to have um, a, a job anymore. But uh, the other part of it, of course, as well, that you know, rightly so, people are sceptical or at least certainly want to understand how you can prove the data is right. And you've been going now for a number of years and you can start to benefit from lost data. But you know, how, how do you sort of see your ability to be able to demonstrate to companies that actually what you're designing with the algorithms, however humble they are, are actually validated by either real life or you can, can, you can provide really compelling evidence that these are the right this is the right information to use to trigger a decision. Yeah, so we, uh, we, we've been live with a few customers for a little while now, and previous to going, prior to going live, we run all kinds of validation tests, uh, but those are essentially the best guess. You know, the proof is really in the pudding once you go live. So we have a number of customers that are starting to see those results coming through, and depending on the application, you know, there's really two things you want to be looking at. The first is uh, the expense ratio, and you know, have what you've, what you've done and what you've implemented actually made any difference to that. We have had customers um, who focused more on the expense ratio side who've seen, uh, I'm thinking back to one customer recently who's just posted their first results from an implementation with us where their average underwriting time in one particular sector uh, went down from six hours uh, to underwrite the risk uh, down to about 40 minutes. And so that was really through the connection of what we were doing was going out and collecting all the data that they required for their underwriting, connecting it all together, extracting what was relevant for them and putting it in front of the underwriter. So it is really about making people do more with their time. Um, so you know, taking away the boring work and making underwriters focus on what's actually exciting. So underwriting the risk, maintaining those good relations with distribution channels. Um, so yeah, so, so the proof is in the pudding. I think we have a, a white paper coming out in the next couple of weeks with a few case studies in it, which, which will outline some of the results as well. Great. Well, it certainly sounds a better marketing pitch to make underwriting exciting than uh, we're going to do away with the underwriter. Uh, and it's, what about the tough challenges? What are you finding it is actually really difficult to design an algorithm for or, or to use AI for when it comes to making underwriting decisions? I think one of the biggest challenges we've had is, uh, is actually working with underwriting teams to create something which is really explainable. Um, what I mean by this is when people hear artificial intelligence and machine learning, they think scary computer robots and automation and quite often things that are nonsensical. Um, the reality is that's a flaw in the way that you design your, your algorithms. Uh, you have to design explainability from day one into your applications and into your programs. It's, it can't be an afterthought. Um, and we're building tools for humans, so it has to be explainable. So some of the ways that we've learned to do that, and it's definitely been uh, an iteration cycle that we've gone through over the last couple of years is, uh, number one is we work with the underwriters from day one to understand what information they already use today. And the second is we provide things such as key drivers. So if we make a prediction or we give a score about a particular risk, um, we always make sure we give enough information and context to back it up. You can't expect someone to make a decision without context. So it's not purely science. There's a little bit of art in there as well. But for us, that's definitely been a, a big challenge. Fantastic. Okay, we do have... So I just want to leave us a couple minutes for... Uh, for questions. So do we have any questions for Ham Hamza about what he's up to or what Saitora is up to? So if the modeling that you're doing is actually based on data, what is the effect of new regulation coming in uh, for people to actually obfuscate their data or remove their data from your systems? Because that then diminishes the gene pool, as it were, from which you can make your assumptions. So first of all, say that we are GDPR compliant as a company, so please don't report us to anyone. Um, but but it, you know, data privacy when it comes to artificial intelligence has basically been there since the beginning of when machine learning algorithms started. Um, for us, being our focus on commercial lines doesn't totally negate us from that, um, but a lot of the information that we use is publicly accessible. So it's quite rare that we will actually try and get people's personal information um, to use it within the models. And I think when you start getting into those levels, you start to enter a whole new phase of ethical modeling and what information is okay to use when you're making a decision about somebody. Uh, and that almost takes a step back when you think about insurance more generally, um, is that you know, it's there to protect people when things go wrong. So at what level is it not okay to start adversely selecting against people because of information that you may or may not know about them? I think I heard you saying that you, um, you, you, your software brings data together in a nice, usable format and that it um, helps people see how um, important the different data points are that they 
wanted. Are there any second order insights that, oh, now that the underwriter has seen this, now they're asking this question? Most of our products uh, and new products that are coming out have come totally from our customers' demands. So our roadmap is totally influenced by what they want. Um, the example is when we started off by doing, uh, one of our first products was uh, providing risk scores to underwriters at the point of underwriting. Uh, very quickly after that, they started asking us for information if they could provide it earlier in the value chain or earlier in the workflow where they said, hey, when the submission comes in, can you tell me something about the risk even before I've had to spend like 10 minutes looking at it? Um, so then we started focusing on that part of the workflow and saying, okay, well, we can extract information from the submission, do some sort of information parsing, uh, maybe even attach some useful info to it, depending on what that business's uh, goals were, uh, and provide that back to the underwriter in that state. So there are many, many second order benefits. Similar to what Reza mentioned previously, I'd say that we're still very much in the infancy stage of the product development within this underwriting workflow and what it's gonna look like. But yeah, our roadmap is 100% is influenced by, by what our customers want to do next. We definitely see it as them building things on top of our platform, and we love it when they do that. Great. Well, Hamza, thank you very much for taking time off. It's obviously a very busy job to join us here. <laughs> okay, next up we have Mark Cunningham, one of the uh, co-founders from Wenfresh. Wenfresh is an example of a company that we are seeing more and more of coming into insurance, where you've built a strong track record outside of insurance and you're now discovering an opportunity to come in and offer what you're, you're, you've built already in your relationships mm -hmm. to the insurance companies. So perhaps just in a, in a, in a few words, perhaps just tell us what friend, when Fresh does and then what you're looking at doing in the insurance space. Sure. So when Fresh is a, a data supermarket. We uh, line up samples of data side by side so the insurer can decide what piece of information is useful for them. So it's... Um, multiple sets of the same thing from different sources where we define the provenance, tell you when it was last checked, and then you can access and play with to your heart's content. Uh, everybody here this evening, if you want to, it's mymy.api.wenfresh.com, and you all have 50 lookups, so you can go and play on the API yourselves and see what data looks like if it's useful to you. Yeah, so you're sourcing data, and I'd like to come back in a minute to talk about some of the clever ways you source data. Mm. Can you give an example of how your insurance clients are using that data in their own, in their own uh, business? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with our first and biggest customer. So it's uh, the Bank of England um, consume a shed load of data from us every day. A shed load is a technical term. It means lots and lots and lots and lots of data. But what they're really looking for is what happened since yesterday in terms of price shifts on properties and property valuations, uh, what's been built since yesterday, what's changed in the housing stock, what's mortgaged, what's not. So they're, tra they're essentially taking a currency risk using the data. Um, but the key is, can we access everything now? And, and, and so you're not a, a, a tyranny to delay. You, know, we, you need to be able to get online and get all of the data that you need, and you need to have it available to your underwriters or your, um, your algorithmic calculations or your data scientists, but it has to be now, not later. And that's kind of what we do. So for the insurance companies, in a really, really simple format, what you're doing is you're asking the questions of, what do you need to know in order to give this person a price without actually having to ask them? So you avoid the moral hazards of them being incorrect or the likelihood that they don't know the answer. So what we do is take that uncertainty away. So you're, you're basically providing pre-filled data for insurers? In a really basic format, yeah. But the, the reality of it is, and ensure whether the underwriting team, and we deal with a, a large number, and bear in mind, we were invested into by an insurer. Oh, yeah, sorry, maybe you don't know this, but the history of the company is we were, we were data processors for Zoopla Property Group, and uh, the business just grew and grew, and then we, um, we build the path file for Royal Mail, and we do all that kind of good stuff around addressing. And then an, an insuring uh, underwriter came to us and said, we really like your software, how much for the company? So we're not ready to sell yet, but we'll sell you some of it. Um, and they do a lot of uh, reinsurance brokering, and what they wanted to know was, if I'm looking at a risk book, can you tell me instantaneously how risky this thing is at an individual address base so that I can value the portfolio and take an arbitrage position? So that's where it came from. It's, it, as I said, it, it's data now to figure out risk now. Now, you've been quite clever, so I don't know how much of this you want to you give away to this audience, but they're all very discreet. What has impressed me is, is the way you acquire your data, because one of the challenges insurance companies have is that you, you can either go out and get data that's free on the web, but there's, there's all sorts of challenges with that mm. in terms of validation and processing. 
you very cleverly partnered the companies. You mentioned Zoopla. Yeah. In a way, you know, I assume you've given, you feel the business is going to be a success. Your cost of acqu acquiring the data is less than what you can sell it for, so you can make some money on it. Can you, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that, how you do that? that yeah, so how do we acquire the data? Um, we uh, approach a company that might have interesting data and say, can we process it in such a way to make it consumable by a particular industry? So whether it was talking to the big banks who gave us uh, their, what their results from surveys were. So they sent people in to survey the houses before they lent on them. We got the copies of the survey. So as long as you anonymize the data as to who did the survey and for whom the survey was done, but you can say, well, that address, this was the outcome. And then you look at billing data, and you can do the same with that. And you look at uh, construction records, you can do the same with that. But we went around partner by partner saying, put your data in here. So we did two things for them. Firstly, we made it profitable for them to do this, but out of their waste product, their sort of digital exhaust. But we also made it faster for them to get their own data back from us than we were getting from their own systems. And that was a massive win. In fact, some insurers are now contributing data because it's quicker for them to get the data from us than it is for them to go to their own IT departments and get the data. So we built the API. Go and have a look at it, uh, and you'll see how fast you can get hold of your own data. That's why I love sitting up here, because someone like you says, well, we just went and got every bit of data from Zupra, and then we went and got every bit of construction information, and you know, clearly there's a, that's really, really hard to get that right. But you know, congratulations for being able to pull that together and to make, make some money about it, and also sharing your, uh, your stories with us. How, how do you then... A similar question to I was asking Hamza. How do you then validate it, though, for the insurance companies? I mean, again, yeah, it's no, a critical question. question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, okay, so the advantage is every time you get a new set of data that gives you some information about a place where you already have somebody else's view of that, is you're able to line it up. So uh, insurer X thinks it's a four-bird 1921 build, building of blast size. Oh, but the bank thinks it's something else. But the surveyor thinks it's something else. Oh, the valuer thought it was this. And as long as you line them all up and go, right, that's the truth as far as each of those parties are concerned, then for the risk teams, they can download the data and go, okay, which one is most predictive? When I was talking about the supermarket element of this, it is equivalent to going to Sainsbury's. I mean, I don't care which ketchup you buy. I'll put all the ketchups lined up, and you decide which one you think is tasty. And are you getting caught up, caught up in this POC problem with people wanting to spend forever validating it? Uh, we're, we're releasing a piece of software to enable the buy side, that will be you guys, throw your data on and have a report that only you can see, we can't see it, but it will publish the bits that are meaningful for you. So you could say, here are the places that I suffered a loss, this is the loss that I had, it calculates saying, okay, so the data that would have been predictive for you is this, this, and this. But we don't get to see the recipe, that's your IP. Okay, well, before we hand over to questions, I do have one, one question that I think many people in this room are, are wondering about. So, you started off in the music industry, mm. did some pretty cool stuff there, and then you decided to go and work in insurance. Um, <laughs> does that mean we all made the cool choice? We're better off being in You've insurance? You've made a phenomenal choice. Yeah, I feel like that story about John Major, who ran away from the circus to become an accountant. Yeah, I, I, yeah I'm feeling the same pain sometimes. No, the, the, the challenge is that the music industry is full of flakes, and I'm a data guy, so it was extremely difficult to make it work. That's fantastic. <laughs> but well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions, but I'm sure yeah. you'll, be around, you'll be around at the, uh, the break for anybody. Or if they want to find out more about Wenfresh, what's the best way to track you down? Wenfresh.com, find me on LinkedIn, find David on LinkedIn, and go play with the API. It's my, M-Y dot A-P-I dot Wenfresh dot com. Go have a play. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for listening. It's been a pleasure. Okay, well, finally, um, this half is an old friend of Instead London, Nick Martin. Nick, I think, was in a, in a bar somewhere with Paolo and Robin when there were probably about three of you just starting up Instead London. So, so Nick, thanks for uh, joining us again. Um, I will let you introduce yourself, but you're going to talk to us a little bit about your experience in AI. But probably just kick it off. Just, just tell us a little bit about who you are and your day job. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, so I'm Nick Martin. I run the uh, global insurance strategy at Polar Capital, so, which has been going now for just over 20 years. I've done 17 of those, so uh, uh, invest in, in a reasonable size of money into largely the incumbent community. So I get a sort of view from this sort of executive uh, boardroom when it comes to all the good stuff like, you know, insure tech, innovation, uh, disruption and, and the like. So always good to get an alternative point of view. Good. Well, I mean, those of us who spend most of our lives doing this find it hard enough to keep up with all those companies out there. How, how do you manage to track what's happening in AI in addition to what you're doing? You're running a successful investment fund. 
Yeah, well, with, with some difficulty, and it's events like this that really uh, obviously help uh, maintain some of that uh, that knowledge. And I think you know, Reza touched on the point uh, earlier. Sometimes AI is you know is used as a sort of catch-all kind of word. And you know, a couple of years ago, I actually you know spent a bit of time you know, looking at you know, what is AI, what is machine learning, what is deep learning, and all that stuff. So there is actually an Instech London podcast, one of the first ones on, on AI. So I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, with all the buzzword terms, but if you're not, uh, I, I suggest sort of checking that out. I, th I think one thing I did realize very sort of early on is you know, AI is all about prediction, and of course, you know, insurance you know, is about all about prediction you know, as well, and I think over time, you know, the insurance product's going to move from sort of, you know, a, you know, re repair and replace kind of business model to one of prevent and predict, and, you know, and AI obviously has a, has a huge relevance in terms of that prediction side of things. Uh, we heard earlier from, um, from Hemzo uh, uh, Saitora, he mentioned the uh, predictions machine book, and I, and, and I certainly would recommend that. And I was very fortunate to spend um, about an hour with, with AJ, and, uh, um, who, who was the author of that book, at the University of Toronto when I visited there um, earlier in April. And I think that's one thing that I would, I would certainly recommend is, is look beyond you know, the, uh, you know, what can be the goldfish bowl of insurance and try and have some learnings for, from, from other industries. And books like that, AI Superpowers is another good one uh, I would recommend in terms of trying to keep up with what is a, obviously a very fast moving industry. And, and Nick, just on that point about the podcast, you're a bit like, you know, a bit like um, Mark or his colleagues with their back catalogue of music artists, you are kind of like the Elton John of Instead London, because your podcast gets downloaded about five times a week, so you are still the expert on AI, even though it was about three, three years ago, so thank you for that. Uh, so I know you can't name names, but as you look out across the insurance incumbents, how, what sort of range do you see of those that are actually effectively using their own data, uh, where of course they've got a big competitive advantage versus those that have got lots of data but just can't figure out what to do with it? Yeah, it's something you know, I think about a lot, and I think it's often forgotten that the, you know, arguably the insurers are the original data companies. They've, they've got a lot of good, good stuff there, and the question is, can they really use that sort of legacy data set for, for some uh, advantage uh, or, or not? And, and I think you know, a lot of it will come down to you know, how fundamental has data and analytics been to your business model over time, and, and whether that data is really accessible. I mean, there's a lot of uh, companies now will, would offer services to, uh, to get out that unstructured data you know, for those uh, uh, legacy companies, so, so maybe there's a bit of catch-up that, that can happen there. But you know, many of the leading companies that I talk to will, would, would argue, actually, you've already got uh, as much data as you can possibly ever want, and it's actually more of a challenge in, in how to put that to some uh, good use. I mean, one, one question that I always like to ask of... Um, of management teams is, is which of these two options would you rather have? You know, option number one is, is having a abundant data set worked on by a couple of uh, uh, data scientists, uh, newly qualified graduates, or option number two is a much narrower data set worked on by a couple of uh, AI professors from a world leading university. And actually, the answer today is, is really number one. So I know I think so that the, the war for the, the AI talent is, is probably not as important as it maybe used to be, and actually having that data in the first place is actually going to be uh, in a, a significant advantage. We've heard a lot about uh, a lot of support about underwriters here tonight, and the, you know, the role of underwriters is not going to disappear. But the industry has got a cost problem, and ultimately, it's, it's a lot of it's about people. So, you know, where are you on that spectrum of like sort of zero robotic underwriter to we still need human intervention? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a big question everyone's sort of uh, talk, talking about, you know, is, is the days of the underwriter uh, numbered? I, I, I would say uh, no, not at all. Uh, and I, I would look at, you know, other industries, you know, that are affected by technology. You know, the, the jobs change and, and, and underwriters are going to be no different in that. You know, AI is a, is a, is a very powerful tool to be added to, to a toolkit of any underwriter. And you know, there's talk of it, as I say, you know, Bionic underwriters, augmented underwriters, whatever term you want to use, but I, I think that, you know, that that's a very real possibility that underwriters can move slightly up the complexity spectrum. You know, AI will, will undoubtedly free up time to spend more with clients and you know, develop new products. You know, uh, that kind of thing, and there's going to be parts of the underwriting market which which will, which will be fundamentally changed. And SME is probably you know, a good example of that. Where you know, you go back a few years, maybe underwriters will underwrite a lot of individual risk, and today it's a little bit more about portfolio management. Good. Well, a good good answer given that um, 
I think 50% of our audience tonight are from, uh, from under, underwriters. Uh, hopefully we'll see them back again. Uh, you talked a bit about the money, money ball and, and the relevance to underwriting and insurance. What, what's that all about? Yeah, well, this is the sort of concept that I've been thinking a little bit um, about. So, so money ball, I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with, with the book and the, and the subsequent film. Uh, just in case you're not, this was a U.S. Um, a baseball coach that took a, a whole group of what looked on paper to be very flawed players and put them together into a, a championship winning team. You know, the, the key to all of that was changing the unit of reference from the individual player to, to the results of the team overall. And I, and I think you, know, you, you can draw a, a very strong parallel there with, with what we've just touched on on the, on the SME side. You know, maybe you do get a lot of uh, uh, you know, straight through sort of processing or, you know, of particular risks. You know, underwriters may feel slightly uncomfortable uh, with, 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 with that, you know, letting the, you know, the machine do all the hard work, but actually you know, the, you know, the more added value is going to be managing those uh, portfolios and considering you know, those uh, returns on, on, in, in an aggregate type of basis rather than individually underwriting every single risk. So I, mean, I guess it comes full circle back to where we started. Is, is part of your day job then is to really understand how well companies are adopting technology, not, not just in the individual star underwriter, but how do they deploy it across across the whole team. Good, and just finally, just to, just to, um, to wrap up, as a sort of theme tonight a little bit around talent uh, and you know, struggle for insurance. Although it's good to hear that, you know, with, with Mark said, we're kind of, a, you know, insurance is more exciting than, than the music industry. Uh, you know, what, what do you think the insurance industry needs to do to keep bringing people in that are going to move, move the industry forward? I think what, what we've seen in the industry is a reasonably good uh, communication of, of the sort of protection gap, you know, the extent of underinsurance, you know, in the world, particularly around natural catastrophes. But I would argue also there's a communications gap you know, out there, uh, and I think the industry, you know, has probably over time not presented itself to the broader society in the way it should. It, it actually, you know, is extremely important, you know, industry, particularly in times of you know people sort of troubles, whether that be caused by you know a natural catastrophe or, or, or whatever and you know one of my key challenges in, in, in talking to my own investors is trying to convince them that insurance is actually you know hugely important in, in what it does and I think you know, any initiatives out there to, to really communicate those big wider goals you know insurtech is not a zero-sum game you know that it can it be used to expand the overall industry pie should be actively encouraged and, and, and hopefully we'll hear more about Reza's you know initiative in a, at another time and Fortunately, I think the industry itself is starting to, 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 to realise this to, to some extent. We saw a couple of years ago the establishment of the Insurance uh, Development Forum by a number of the leading uh, companies. Uh, we had some great news um, and not so long ago that the Secretariat is based here in London, which I think is a very positive uh, for the London uh, in, in insurance uh, market. There's a new London centre uh, uh, being developed around sort of climate change and analytics. And I think you know, some of those big industry initiatives can probably better communicate you know, some of the, the, the problems that are out there to attract you know, that, that top talent you know, into the uh, insurance industry. You know, you're not going to get the top AI data scientists if all you can say to them is, please come in and cleanse my data. It needs to be bigger problems than that for them to address. Well, Nick, again, we just run out of time, but that was really helpful. Thank you very much. It's, and, and for those of you that, that don't know or haven't seen Polar Capital, it's, a, it's, uh, it's great to hear from somebody that actually puts their, uh, I guess, puts their money where their mouth is and actually really is looking at real companies investing and has been, been successful at it. So, Nick, thank you very much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, if you enjoyed that, then look out for our next episode, which is the second half of the evening. Robin Mertens is joined on stage by five companies talking about also what they are doing with AI and algorithms. Uh, more details about this event, our past events and our future events, as well as our corporate membership program are on our website at www.instec.london. And if you want to be sure of not missing out on registration when that opens for our future events, we do recommend you sign up for our newsletter on the website.